You're listening to Playmakers, episode four. On every episode, I interview a game industry expert and I dive into their area of expertise to come away with nuggets of useful information to help you get better at what you do and get a bigger, wider, rounder view of the game industry so that you have creative and business success. This week, we have the legendary Lauren Lanning, creator of Oddworld. It is an incredible, unbelievable interview. So good, I had to turn it into two parts. This is part one. You're listening to Playmakers. Hello, hello. This is Jordan, and you're listening to episode four. Obviously, last week was the launch week of the show, and I am very excited to say that it's going incredibly well. Thank you so much for what you're doing, for listening, downloading, subscribing, all that stuff. It makes a difference. The reviews are coming in. I love seeing that, and I really appreciate it. Let me know how I can make it better. Just send me an email, jordan at brightblack.co, and tell me what guests you want to have on, what topics you think need to be covered, and I'm going to make it happen to the best of my ability anyway. So, oh, we have a new website. If you listened to the first three episodes, you might have gotten sick of hearing me say, brightblack.co slash playmakers. It's a bit of a mouthful. And now you don't have to worry about that anymore because you can just go to playmakerspodcast.com. Playmakerspodcast.com takes care of all of your Playmakers podcast needs. It's easy for me to say. It's easy for you to hear. Check it out. See what it looks like. So that's new. And with those bits of business out of the way, let's get into this week's epic interview with Lauren Lanning. So Lauren is... To me, just an incredibly inspirational guy. His creative work, his success with the Oddworld franchise, you know, it's still being played today, talked about today. The remakes are coming out and they're doing great. And I think that just goes to show that Lauren has created something bigger than just a game. He's really created a world. And what's cool about this interview is we get into that stuff. So the interview is really long, it's really dense. And I'll be upfront with you. We cover a lot of topics that are not pure game industry stuff. He gets into some politics, uh, FYI, and he also gets into a lot of personal stuff about what drives him to make games. The interview is pretty heavy, pretty dense, and I split it up into two parts. Today, in part one, I would say the theme is what drives Lorne to make the games that he makes, his reasoning, his way of trying to have an impact on society through his work, and how to him, art is a challenge to have something to say. And I'll tell you, that's had a big influence on me. We recorded the interview last year before Trump was elected, and so I've had a little time to think about it, and it certainly had an impact on me. And that's kind of what part one is about. And then in the second part, we talk about, okay, so if you have this message, you have something you want to say, how do you actually get it out there in today's ecosystem? How do you get funding in a way that still lets you be independent. So that's coming up in part two of the interview. So again, this interview goes to some unusual places for an industry-focused podcast, but I want you to come with us there because on the other side, I came out more inspired to bring my message into my work, and I hope that you will too. So that is coming up. Here is Lauren Lanning. Lauren, I'm super excited to have you here. Thanks for coming on the show. It's great to be here. It's good to see you again, Jordan, and uh, thanks for having me on. What is really interesting to me about you, in addition to your work, is your business and how you run it. So as we talk about this, this podcast is really for people in the industry. You know, with that in mind, I'd love to hear about how you made the transition from working as a director at at Rhythm and Hughes. And my assumption is that you're doing a lot of kind of commercial and special effects work. Yeah, that's what we were doing. And I was a visual effects director, not a uh, true director in that respect visual effects supervisor, art director, and then down the chain uh, through the years. But yeah, so not a client director, visual effects supervisor, yeah. How did you go from that to the creator of Oddworld? That's really what I want to know. Well, start off a little bit. My first life professionally was really in the fine art world. And that put me around a number of basically heavy intellectuals. In the New York scene, I was an assistant to who was my favorite artist in the world, and then I got to become his assistant. Who is that? That was Jack Goldstein. And uh, he died in, I think, 2006, I believe, uh, suicide. But he was really hardcore intellectual uh, and a very interesting guy, very passionate guy. You know, the artist, 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 like truly. And I got to see a lot 
and hear a lot of sort of political analysis, various philosophies, uh, you know, contemporary art uh, deconstruction, psychoanalysis, things like that. That turned on to a different level of thinking than anything I had had in art school or learned in art history. It was sort of views of the world and uh, getting around some of these heavy people were a little more like, well, that's really – interesting you're painting your dragons and your guys with axes but what do you you know what do you care about in life and how is that reflecting in your art and what difference are you going to make are you impotent or not and it was really like that hardcore right like Like you were challenged by that yeah totally challenged and i was like hey look at how i paint and they're like that's nice you paint just fine where's your ideas and what are you really about and it was like huh you know and then and i started to learn that the greatest art through the ages whether it was poetry novels films, theater, you know, various music was people that were really talking about something else and the art was a vehicle to execute on that something else. It was a vehicle to get ideas out, you know, and art through the ages has really been more of a catalyst for changes in thinking when you need it most. For example, when Joseph Campbell died, who was arguably the world's greatest expert on historical mythologies, when he died, he was kind of begging the artist to step up because politics had failed us and and it was basically saying there's no hope of change. Corporations had failed us. Institutions had failed us. All these things failed us. So where's the sanity? And we're caught up in a bunch of misinformation and misdirection and all these things where basically what we need to really survive seems to be lost. And really that was kind of the artist's message through time. If we go back to the very beginning, cave art on the walls uh, was often visualizing what they needed to survive. So typically we find cave art of the hunt, right? The hunt Mm -hmm. was something they would visualize at night in the fire because they needed that hunt to succeed if they were going to live through next week. And so art was a catalyst for putting forth what we need as people to help us survive. And really from the cave art from the beginning to today, Stanley Kubrick's movies, you know, not Michael Bay's movies, (laughs) which is really commerce, right? So Michael Bay's movies, we would say, well, that's commerce. It's entertainment. It's entertainment. You know, it's it's product. Whereas uh, Scorsese or Kubrick were really making art and using film as an art form. And what I mean by that is shining light on uncomfortable, inconvenient topics or inconvenient truths. And uh, Kubrick, you could deconstruct at an amazing level for what was he really talking about? What was he really trying to show you? And why was it being undercover? You know, some of the stuff he was talking about was so sensitive, he didn't want to get blacklisted. Uh, But he felt like these are the things that people need to learn, and this is why I'm making films. Because he was really bored with films. I mean, the guy was super genius. But the point being is that the idea of art is something that can shape consciousness, that can help give people direction. And we find it with our favorite songs. We find it in our favorite movies. You know, what's your favorite movie? You know, it's funny because I, I saw your favorite movies while, while I was researching for this interview. Oh, and yes. one of them is the one that I usually answer with, which is 2001. There you go, right? Like 2001 is so stacked with subtext and, you know, you can deconstruct that and figure out what he was talking about, what he was warning about and uh, reflecting on policies and all, all the deceptions and all these things. And it was really like it made you think for years to come. Like I still I went back and watched 2001. It moved a little slow for the 21st century mind, but it was still like. Wow, these were fascinating ideas to contemplate considering, what was it, 69 that that movie was made? 68, 69, something like that. 68, 69. So, you know, and then we had a lot of other movies made at that time that we've completely forgotten. And we forgot the week after we saw them, right? But then we have that film, and, and so now we're talking 69, 47 years later, and we're still talking about it. Right? And that's, that's the difference. And so what differences do these things make? For example, the film Red Dawn. The producer of that movie said, we need a movie that makes America feel good about war again. With that message, he was able to get a lot of military support for all the vehicles in the movies. And they gave it to him because they wanted a message that made Americans feel good about war again. So if you look at entertainment and media as a manipulative design, as a propaganda design, it's all around us all the time. And as I looked at it as basically a wannabe storyteller – Right. A wannabe storyteller, A, who B, didn't want to be poor. 
<laughs> right? Like, so I say, well, I really want to have this more noble sort of approach, but I'm not willing to be the guy who's out there in the picket lines and going to jail or, you know, being poor because I grew up that way and it's not any fun. So as I was looking at this possibility of how do we merge more of sort of the, the intent of art, which is a great book. It's called The Mission of Art by a guy named Alex Gray, which is really about how has art changed civilization through the ages and why. These are things that also inspired me. And so I was looking at how do we take art and particularly pop art, which means where is the mind share of the audience at? And video games was it. If you're looking at this in the 1990s, you mm-hmm. go, oh, Oh my God, you know, 60 billion hours of American mindshare is going into video games a year. And it's very impressionable mindshare as well. Yes, because it's selective focus for a longer duration of time. And it's not a passive engagement, it's a concentrated engagement, right? Like you're actually doing things versus watching the television where you're not. So I was looking at that and I was like, huh, to me, a term that I coined was like, how do we create more Trojan horse pop? And in this category, I would also put something like South Park or The Simpsons, meaning South Park's and The Simpsons probably to this day have had more intelligent reflection on the truths of what's going on in our world that are basically we're not supposed to be talking about because it's not politically correct or it's not in favor at the moment. But those shows have had more critical insight into our landscape of, of American you know, happenings than most of the news, 60 Minutes, and all these other places combined have brought to the public. Meaning, I've watched Simpsons hundreds of times back when it was really interesting before it got watered down. And you're like, how are they able to say this on TV? They're totally ripping apart, truthfully, what our political structure is. And the news isn't doing it. I mean, South Park had Mohammed on. They had <laughs> yeah. a cartoon of Mohammed on. I mean, these guys are going for it, right? Like They really do. As I've heard another Jordan say, Jordan Greenhall, who created uh, DivX, who's a real brilliant guy, he goes, well, South Park is trying to get you to stop watching. And they have, <laughs> they have yet to stop pulling out the plugs on how deep they'll descend to get you there, you know, to talking turds, you know, they, and, and we still watch. But the point is, that was what I would categorize more as Trojan horse pop. And the same with, like, let's say, the Muppets. So that's the term that you mentioned coining is Trojan horse pop. I like that. Yeah. It uses the pop channel to try and basically provide more nutritious value. Spoonful of sugar kind of thing. Yeah. So instead of a spoonful of sugar, maybe it's, uh, you know, it's it's organically raised honey. (laughs) You know what I mean? Rather than than, uh, corn corn soup uh what do they call it sucrose you know corn derived sucrose is that right sucrose fructose sucrose or the very uh the various varieties that will give you cancer all the oses <laughs> yeah you know but the point being is like okay well people want to be entertained by this type of thing and that is a form of escapism but so was George Orwell's Animal Farm. It was a form of escapism, or 1984. It was a novel to read, right? But it had lasting impact on people to the degree that we now call terms that are totalitarian Orwellian, right? From novels. Those weren't philosophy books. They were novels. And in some cases, Animal Farm, novels for kids. I read in elementary school. So my point being is that the pop channel can be used to deliver, let's just say, more nutritious value. And what constitutes nutritious value? Well, probably um, mindsets or ideas that, are, that serve humanity better or serve a healthier planet better rather than practices that make things worse. Now, this kind of sounds kind of highfalutin and a little bit, you know, outside of the business realm. And you're asking me, you know, what was driving it. This was really what was driving it for me because while I didn't want to be poor, at the same time, I didn't want to do things I didn't believe in. And I had been doing plenty of that. Coca-Cola, polar bear commercials, cigarette commercials for South America, weapons defense programs for TRW, uh, Star Wars stuff. You know, I'd, I'd participated, you know, earned a living to learn skills, but I didn't believe in what I was doing. I didn't believe in trying to make snazzier, hotter Super Bowl class commercials to get kids to buy more soda, chemical water for a population that now is obese and is diabetic and increasingly lowering in IQ measurably decade to decade. So when I looked at that, I was like, you know, instead of just selling bullshit, how can we sell better ideas that might inspire people, give them some hope? When we look at this landscape today, 
it's so overwhelming to the individual, most likely coming from a dysfunctional family, which most of us did. You know, if you didn't, <laughs> you know, bless you, right? Good for you. I did. Most of the people I know did. We're all damaged in slightly different ways. It's a pretty intimidating planet out there. And we're just overwhelmed with all these experts that basically threaten us not to compete or challenge with their law of the land or the framework that they want to lay things into. But a lot of that is not helping anyone. And what it does is it diminishes hope in the individual. And what I came to believe is hope is something that I wanted to base my stories around like it's an endangered natural resource that we should be fostering more. So I wanted to create stories in the model of Trojan Horse Pop that started with a character who is most likely worse off than you, the player, in life. So instead of going, oh, you know, I want to make the tougher Rambo, instead I want to, I want to take the guy you last want to be, the guy you really don't want to be. And then I want to create a course where – we build empathy and we focus on empathy as a connection between that character. We take away the old game rules that said if you fail X amount of times, you've failed completely. And we say fail infinitely as long as you're willing to try, you could succeed. Because that's how I felt life was. Life doesn't say you get three tries and then you're, you're fucked and you're <laughs> right. in this you know, categorized class of losers. You have the opportunity to keep on trying, right? But do we have the will and do we have the hope to even do that? And watching, you know, I knew a number of people that committed suicide, uh, got caught up whether it was re really uh, dangerous behaviors with crime and cultures that were embedded in that. Or uh, people that just lost themselves to drugs, you know, like mm. pretty extreme falling off the deep end. When you see that happen to good people, people that you know were good, had a chance, and if for whatever reason get, get lost in life, I was like, wow, that's the seven, or we're approaching seven billion people in the world. And how many people are going through this dilemma? I mean, I grew up in lower middle class America, which is really a higher standard of living than almost. The other billions of people on the planet. Oh, yeah. So how hard is this and how rare is this hope, is this inspiration to find that basically as a content experience can make someone walk away and go, you know what, that just empowered me a little bit in my own life. You know, that, that gave me this or that extra push. Now, that sounds a little highfalutin. No, actually, I, was, I just wanted to say that it doesn't because I think I personally, and I guarantee you a lot of people listening to this who work in games – also, you know, want that and, and are trying to figure out the right way to get there from wherever they are, you know, and what they do in the industry. So I absolutely think this is this is great stuff. But, you know, it wasn't necessarily, you know, winning investors, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, right. yeah, let's change the world, make it a better place. Uh, at what profit margin, you know, is, is uh, you know, that's life, right? So then we have to figure you know, nowadays out. Nowadays, it's like what multiple. Yeah, I'm not a fan of capitalism, which... The shallow mind, it can misrepresent, oh, I get it, buy my product, but I don't believe in capitalism. It's like, Jesus Christ, it's a lot more complex than that. And what I don't believe in is winner, rape, all, which is exactly the model that we're looking at today. And in terms of, you know, look at anything, it's, it's a duopoly system, right? You get to become a monopoly as long as there's two of you, and then you can crush pretty much everyone else in the playing field. And we deforest, you know, just look at what the TPP was trying to pass recently. I don't know if you paid any attention to that, the new global trade that uh, Obama was trying to slip in underneath the radar and make it illegal for people to know what it was before it passed. And then uh, Greenpeace outed it. I don't know too much about it. This, this is just terrible stuff. I mean, nasty, nasty stuff. Bad for everybody except international, multinational corporations. But bad for the environment, bad for the consumer. It's just, just bad stuff. It's all based on this growth model that has no room to say, it has any other real interest as long as it's legal. And the model is, as you would say, as you said, it's about multiples of return, right? Which is basically we as entrepreneurs are borrowing money from the richest. Let's say it's VCs or something. So we can go out and work our hardest and hopefully get a few pennies out of the back end as they, you know, make even more for doing even less, which is the model. Yeah, I mean, it is, right? Like, I've raised VC twice. It seems like there's a lot less bootstrapping these days, but I don't know if that's real or just a perception. I don't know either. And uh, I think what I've learned is I don't want financing. And the reason is because I want to be able to make decisions uh, based on where I want to go. Fortunate enough that we've been able to do it 
self-financing for the last several years. But what that's done is it's removed investors out of the equation. They're saying, how do we get a 5X multiple? Or let's say, you know, even if it's a publisher. And I'm not, I just want to be clear. I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying this the way it is. So if you're with a publisher who's a public company, your impression is probably about the same as mine, which is they really need at least a 5X multiple on these high-risk titles so that it makes up for the losers, you know, and you get a grand slam out of it. As self-financed, we've looked at it and said, well, how do we double Can we double? And there's not an investor on the planet that's going to pay for you if you can return twice their investment. Which is which is wild because it sounds amazing, right? Doesn't it? And this is what I said. You know, I was saying this. uh, I was having this discussion with a senior vice president of a major publisher or manufacturer the other day, and I was saying, you know, our model we shoot at conservatively. Can we double? Because if we can double, we can prosper a little, and we can make more, and we can stay employed, right? Like we can keep doing it. But if we can get investors, we have to be 5x. And now that's if it's a publishing model. I'm not saying it's strictly that way because there are loans opening up to indie groups. Sony started that program. Microsoft has a bit of that program. Uh, Steam is even doing things like that more. Um, So it's becoming more ways to get support to make things if you've you've got promise. But in general, uh, if you're with VCs, they want 10x return minimal. They're hoping for more of a 100x return on a big payout, right? Uh, if you're with publishers, they want a 5x return. But if you're independent, can you get a 2x return? And if you focus on that, which is what we focus on, we go, can we double our money fairly reliably in the next couple of years? And so because the business is so high risk, people go, look, it's not worth it. If you're going to risk that much money, you need much greater returns. High risk should equal greater returns. Basic investment portfolio management strategies, right? Well, also VCs want to lend you lots of money. Like small yeah. amounts of money aren't even worth giving somebody. Right. <laughs> so now right. you need to find an excuse to spend a ton of money. It's kind of like Hollywood. Like Hollywood, if you made a movie for $10 million and it's unbelievable – they still are not going to put $100 million in marketing behind it because their mindset is it can't ever get those returns because it only costs $10 million to make. If you spend $100 million, it could be the same movie at the back end. <laughs> right. They'd be like, well, we spent $100 movie, so therefore it can make you know, uh, a billion because we spent $100 million. But if you only spent $10 million, oh, we would never market it beyond what its initial budget was. You know, It's a mindset that keeps – so it keeps a business as usual, but it's not necessarily – I've talked to the most successful producers in Hollywood that, are, that want to break that model, but the studios are entrenched in it. And I kind of look at it the same way, which is, well, can we lower our expectations? Can we still deliver high-quality products that the audience like? But can we lower our expectations so we don't have to have huge rewards? We can have satisfactory rewards. And on that model, we can keep on building, which means we can keep a brand in the marketplace. We can keep turning new generations onto that brand. And hopefully, you know, we can do it with a frequency, uh, you know, which is something we've been kind of lame at because our frequency has been – our output frequency has been relatively low, you know, especially in the last – well, I say in the last few years, it's been better, but for a window of about eight years, it was, it was nothing. So can we do that? Can we build a business? And like I was saying to the executive, hey, if you were told you can buy this house for $5 million and in two years you could sell it for 10, would you do it? It's like, who wouldn't, right? But if it's a piece of software, the risk margin is too high, you don't want to get involved. You know? So it's kind of like, do you have the self-confidence to treat it as – as you would a house investment. And that's kind of how I look at it. I go, okay, we're, gonna, we're kind of putting it all on red because we're little. We don't have that many reserves. We do live a bit hand to mouth, but before we commit to financing a project, we actually have the money to do it. You know, we don't want to be in, the, in a short change game of ourselves. And with that, then we try to deliver as soon as we can, you know, high enough quality to be viable. And if that continues to build, then we can continue to build growth. And growth, not to just make investors fatter, but just to make our property have uh, more brand penetration in the world. And, you know, we can prosper from it. And everyone involved prospers. Are you looking for investors? No. And the reason is because I get it. And I, you know, I started off Odd World with VC, went through that dance. We survived. It wasn't easy. Uh, and then we raised VC on another venture. Um, we didn't succeed, but it was, it was very fascinating. You know, it was a big learning curve. But what I realized I'm not fully compatible at, recently someone asked me to basically take on a role as a a president slash CEO of an entity that did have big investors. I said, I'm I'm just not interested. And they were like, why? And I was like, because my purpose in life is not just to go make these people more money, 
regardless of quality, regardless of ethics, regardless of everything except staying legal, right? And you can be very unethical and stay legal. And we've seen plenty of that. And I'm sure you have too. And vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah. So I just don't, I just don't want to exist making rich fat guys fatter and being at their beck and call to be like, you need to get in there. You need to solve this problem. You need to, you risk our money, blah, 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 blah. Because it's not about losing their money. It's about making them enough. Right. Right. So we talk 5X returns. You return 2X, you're a loser. I mean, so you win, but you lose. Right. And I was like, you know, I, I just, my purpose in life is not just to try and make rich guys richer. And that's what you're doing when you're, basically fueling a big stock of a big company that needs to move their bar so that their shareholders have better returns. And then you're living under that pressure basically as a general in a military. So let's just consider it like a military operation, right? You've been given a certain amount of money and your, your objective is you got to return with more right now, regardless of anything else. At certain points, they don't really give a shit. They want to know more is coming back. So if you need to kill the village, <laughs> you know, whatever it needs to be, you need to bring that back. Or you need a really good story. You need to have a story worth what they spent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I haven't found a solution, as a lot of scientist friends of mine have said, and some of them are absolutely at the top of their class on the planet. And they'll say, well, name me one corporation that's good for the planet. I've been in a room with some pretty smart guys. No one's come up with an answer yet. Naming one. Right, because they're all based on a model that has nothing to do with like longevity and compatibility with us living on this planet. And for me personally, having seen a lot of uh, environmental destruction, toxicity, pollution, species die off, acid rain in the lakes in New England, I saw all these things as a kid, and it really affected me deeply because I found my peace, peace of mind, and all in nature, and I saw it just being basically obliterated. Which was, again, you know, reducing your hope in the future, things like that. I think a lot of kids deal with today as a crisis. A lot of, a lot of people across the board are dealing with as a crisis today. The anxiety is higher than ever. Personal anxiety is higher than ever. Antidepressants is higher than ever. Depression is higher than ever. You know, I mean, we're just even depression is higher measurably than it was in World War II. Like, this is crazy crazy kind of stuff that we're living for through. And so for me personally, it became about how can I do things that I can go to sleep at night believing in what I do? I believe that people who build things and invest their time and energy and money deserve a return. I don't believe that they should be able to rule the world like Monsanto does, right? This is my issues with uh, capitalism, which is, you know, basically we have, well, it's better than communism, which is a pretty retarded discussion, right? That's like saying there's God or there's no God, but we can't have any intelligent discussion in between what might be driving our universe and reality, right? Not to get too out there. But my point being is I want to go be able to go home and feel good about what I do each day. I don't want to just take the money And I did. And I did that to build skills. But I think we as individuals are catalysts for possible change in a myriad of different possibilities, whether, you know, I met a guy who had uh, come out of Africa and he had a book that was published and he became like a UN representative, all kinds of stuff. It was called Find a Tree. He was just like, it's, it's crazy that these kids aren't learning how to read in Africa. And they didn't have budgets for schools and stuff like this. So he just said one day, he goes, screw it. I'm going to teach these kids how to read. So what he did was he found a tree because it was shade. And then he brought the local kids from the villages around. And they learned how to read. And then they got really excited. And then things started happening because for you know all the compounding benefits. And then people were asking, well, how do we do this? How do we get the money for school? He goes, you don't need the money for school. You need to find a tree, <laughs> right? Like right, do very, the thing. Do the thing, you know? And, uh, and this guy, like I said, eventually he was embraced by the UN, but that's where he began. And so when he went to sleep each night, he was making sure that he did things that made him sleep better, that gave him hope the next day, that he could see some change effect as he continued to live his life. And he felt like that he was giving back in some way. And it wasn't like he was prosperous, but I think that urge is really in all of us. Now, it might get stamped out through trauma or through events that make us cynical or lose hope or, you know. Through insecurity, I think, a lot as well. Yeah, yeah, self-preservation, you know, all these, all these things shape us in different directions. But I think ultimately if we each, you know, it's kind of like if we each walk down the street and pick up a piece of garbage a day, right? If we just did that, eventually we don't have garbage on the streets, right? If we just agreed that if we each do this little piece, we'll have a better world. I'm not saying I'm a saint by any means, but I try to find the way to juggle business, art, and the things that I think 
I have the power to do. And that's really like create experiences that people can engage. And, you know, we've gotten a number of fan letters from people that just stepped off. They played our game and they stopped from committing suicide. I mean, stuff you would never, ever get. But it validated the format of here is a character caught in worse circumstances than you. But if you don't give up, he didn't give up and he got here. And if you don't give up, maybe you can too. That message got reiterated back. And I'm not saying we make therapy games. or <laughs> You know what I mean? Like ours are on the action adventure shelf, right? Star Wars kind of saved me in a different way. Like I was so fed up with all the bullshit religion stuff. People were trying to push on me, this and that. When I heard Yoda, it was like it became sort of a basis for my ideas of a connection to this planet versus this deity or that deity or this miraculous conception or that, you know, miracle over here, like all this bullshit. And I was like, that silly little hand puppet in that movie, <laughs> you know, Frank Oz's voice gave me more validation for what I always felt was true that no one else was saying that, that I became an enormous fan of Star Wars. And when you looked at fan cultures, which is something I, I was studying uh, in trying to create a property, uh, and fan cultures, I, you know, ones that were standing out, of course, is like music, right? The Doors, Hendrix, The Beatles, Elvis, like these people, you know, you can't separate them. How did you study that? What, what did studying that look like? Well, what I started doing was deconstructing. I was like, why does something like Star Trek, why is it able to create Trekkies? Right. Yeah. And Trekkies is like, don't get in an argument with a Trekkie about, you know, uh, uh, why Star Trek's not good or why Gene Roddenberry was a crook or, you know, like they'll, they'd take that shit really seriously. Yeah. You even know? physics, right? I mean, you got to learn a lot yeah. of physics to be a Trekkie. Yeah. Right. So, so what was it? Gene Roddenberry, they were all morality plays about greater possibilities. They were all void of racism. So, it was, you know, uh, Star Trek was one of the first shows that had blacks portrayed in the show as equal participants, not as a subclass. And in American media, that was new. And in fact, you can go back to uh, Ahura. And uh, she was considering quitting Star Trek, just as an example. And she told that to Martin Luther King. And he said, you can't. You absolutely can't do that. And he broke down to her how that was the first role on American TV where there was nothing about race. And she was there and it was, it was absolutely – there was nothing that separated her from any of those other people on the board being female or being a minority in this country. And that was the first time on American media that it was ever being broadcast on a regular show, right? At the same time, we had Archie Bunker. Right, if you think about it, wow. where, where, right? So it was Martin Luther King, and I've heard her interview, and she goes, and, and I didn't realize the role I was playing, and I stayed with Star Trek to the end because I realized there was, a, there was a different importance there. That's an amazing story. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, and so Gene Roddenberry, it was, it was a show that used the mind of a greater possibility, of a greater human empathy, of exploration, of discovery, of fairness, of not stealing people's shit, Right. Let's just not go into another planet and stealing their shit the way that the United States would do in two seconds if it had the ability, just like we're doing in other countries in the world. You know, we make an excuse and we got to go act as saviors and then we go steal their shit. That's what's going on. Not to get into it too deep, but this is the reality we're living in. And most people are seeing through it as time goes on more and more. So that's fan culture. Right. So Roddenberry created Trekkies. My wife's a big Trekkie, Sherry, you know, CEO of Oddworld. But she's a big Trekkie because she loves the morality place. She loved Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone has a hardcore fan base. They play it. I think they still play it on uh, Thanksgiving or New Year's Eve, 24 hours a day. They do all the Twilight Zone episodes. That, thing, that show's like 40 years old. How is it possible that people are still watching it today in black and white? And they still get into it because of the morality plays, because it talked more about us as a species and our, our faults, our catches, the seductions that, that entrap us, uh, you know, the, the id and the ego that entrap us. Like they're morality plays that, that came from a higher – kind of a higher place, you know, their agenda was evolving humanity. So if you look at Gene Roddenberry, evolving humanity is a fair thing to say in the context of how he was shaping stuff. Same with uh, the guy who, was, uh, who brought us uh, Twilight Zone. Have you seen Black Mirror? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's a great one. And there yeah. are only like five or six episodes. There's right? like three seasons and each one only has, yeah, a handful. 
Yeah, the one where they're all in the workout room all the time. Yes, I saw that one. I haven't seen them all yet, but I have seen that one. Yeah, really cool, right? So really these, cool stuff. These are really cool morality plays. And then you get into things like uh, Star Wars. You know, Star Wars was basically samurai monks in space. That's really what was going on. Like, like noble spiritualist warriors defending the weakest of us, not using their power to to steal and oppress and uh, conquer, but using their power to be more human, you know, to allow other people and places the ability to be free. So when you looked at these things of fan culture, what they stuck to is there had to be for intelligent fan base. And, you know, so I'm not saying a pop fan base like uh, Cabbage Patch Kids has its moment or Pokemon Go or something. Pokemon Go has its moment, <laughs> you know. But to really have a lasting fan culture, you had to have more depth in your content to really make people connect to it. It had to be something kind of more noble than uh, our average display. Joss Wheaton comes to mind as another guy who manages to do this. Yeah, he's been uh, he, he's been doing his thing with what's his property is uh, well, he, he had Buffy and then he had Firefly. Firefly is the Fire, one. I'm, people still talk about it, right? Yeah. It, it really stuck yeah. with people. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it kind of has to have a little bit of more noble than what else is going on. And I don't mean that in a hokey way, but in an inspiring way. Like it sets a better example, even if it does it by showing us the worst of things, you know, like Clockwork Orange. Right. There's so, values. Yeah. So it has to have depth. It has to, the, the audience has to know that you're way ahead of them, that, you, that there's more in here, that it's an encryption code, that there's more going on than meets the surface of it. And we see this, this where, uh, you know, properties that we've mentioned, they last the test of time. Uh, people like to decrypt. And when you and I get attracted to something, let's say, you know, Star Wars, and then we find out, you're, like, I like Star Wars. I thought it was really cool to see uh, Samurai Monks in Space, right? I thought the shots were just, you know, teleported me to the other worlds. All that was wonderful. I was a kid. I thought it was great. Then Yoda comes in later episodes. Boom. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, this is really resonating with me now. But what I didn't yet understand until years later, was it was all inspired by the Joseph Campbell Power of Myth series. Right. And that Power of Myth was really about what? The Power of Myth, why we need myths to, to have sort of a target to strive for or to believe in that keeps us, you know, something that uh, has integrity, right? This is healthy. And so uh, in studying fan culture, you go, well, how, what does it take to get people to make tattoos of what they like? Like, that's a pretty big commitment. Right. I saw it with, well, one percent of bikers that had Harley Davidson tattoos. Right. And like the, that was the most hardcore guys walking around. <laughs> you know, that, right. I, I mean, the one percenters like the outlaw bikers, right. Hell's Angels types. And they got tattoos of consumer products on them. How do they feel that close? <laughs> to them? You know, it's the last group. You yeah. expect, right. Make fun of that brand and see what happens to you with those guys. The girl with the Beatles lyrics tattooed onto her leg or her arm, you know, say something bad about the Beatles and see how far you get with her. Right. Like they become defenders of something that holds a higher ideal that they want to share and believe in. So for me, I was looking at that and I was going, wow, why do I have such gravity to the properties that I've stuck to? What can I observe in the people that also have real strong passion to certain entertainment properties? And then as a storyteller, how do I, and this is where the wake up call of being in the art world, how do I not just make cool stories that I like to look at, but really that tap your own being for what you care about in the world, what you think is important, and, and maybe a little more of the world that we'd like to be living in rather than, you know, the dysfunctionality we're all suffering through now. And so that was a big driver for me, which is like, I want to make money. I want to be successful, but I don't believe that we're doing the right things politically. I don't think we're doing the right things for the planet. I have hope, but I see these practices. They're just insane. I mean, they're actually just insane. You know, and we could break it down why it's clinically uh, psychopathic and insane and not good for anybody except a very select few who's taken a, a big harvest and making the rest of us suffer downstream. So I was embedding that knowledge and things I was learning about the world, a lot of it environmental themes, a lot of it racism themes, a lot of it you know basic oppression themes. I mean, l l let's look at today in the world. I was just thinking about the intro to um, the original Odd World and, yeah. and how much it resonates with what's happening in politics <laughs> today. Well, that's exactly, you know, what I was getting at. And I, and I thought that when we first came out with that game, people said, a lot of the reviewers said, well, though it's anti-capitalistic, like that was a bad thing, 
right? Mm-hmm. And then today, you know, New and Tasty comes out <laughs> and and they're going, how forecasting or how, how, wow, amazing, 20 years ago, and yet it's so relevant to today. You know, well, I'm not psychic. I was just well-researched. And so at that time, if I had a conversation in, let's say, uh, the conference room of a film company in Los Angeles in the 1990, early 1990s, and I just happened to say something like, well, your fast food companies are killing the lungs of the planet by raising cheap beef and burning down rainforests. They thought you were a conspiracy theorist, right? This is intelligent people with degrees from American universities had no idea what was happening in the world. No idea. Intelligent. Some of them Ivy League, like, what are you talking about? We're not overpopulated. What are you talking about? That's not happening. So so you're saying these companies are just going to go burn down the world. What kind of idiot are you? And you're like, you are a fucking moron and you're ignorant and you're righteous about it. So now you're slamming people who know something you don't know anything about because you find the idea so outlandish that you can't accept it because you're ignorant, which is basically a result of brainwashing because you've been led to believe that these happy faced logos are happy places. And that's why Oddworld, the consumer is branding of happy faced logos. Right? And so I'm just saying like we could live in a landscape that is supposedly amongst the most educated in the world professionals that were working, making good money, sending their kids to private schools, and they were absolutely clueless about the things that were going to affect their children's future in major ways. Mm. And that stunned me, and it was very frustrating, and I'd learned, just shut the hell up. <laughs> you know, just shut the hell up. Kubrick shut the hell up. He made films, but he never talked it's about them. It's in the work, it. yeah. It's in the work. I think also the, the you know, kind of the, the theme of the, of the individual against corporate interest or industrial interest or profit motive those are, if not eternal themes, they're at least, they're American themes. They're themes of the current kind of economic paradigm. So they're not timeless maybe forever in that sense, but they're timeless to our, our time. Right. You know, 20 right. years is nothing for that theme, right? Right. Exactly. That's a hundreds of years kind of thing. Exactly. And uh, unfortunately, what's happening is, like, if we look at the youth today, how much of it is watching the news? So these are success stories to me. How much is watching the news? Almost nobody, right? It's getting on their grandparents and one watching the news. They, their parents aren't even watching the news anymore because they get it's all bullshit. They get it's all on, you know, 900 plus outlets in the United States, magazines, television stations, uh, film studios, all of the media that most people receive, if it's not from independent sources on the internet, is owned by six corporations, period. Yeah. Now, 20 and 30 not years ago. Not this podcast, ago. though. Not this podcast. <laughs> free press, man. Real free press. But 20 years ago, they were talking about the conglomeration of media because it's all owned by 20 companies. Mm-hmm. It's a real problem. But you know what? Now that it's all owned by six, we don't have the argument anymore. Right? <laughs> so right. We, we don't hear the argument anymore. But if you remember in the 80s, the argument was emerging amongst the, you know, the, the uh, critical intellectual class. I, I remember even, even five, 10 years ago, people were talking about it. Yeah, not anymore because you lose your job if you're on any of those outlets and talking about it, unless it's a you know, controlled opposition outlet where you're supposed to be acting like you know, you're really like uh, organizations like, uh, well, I don't, I don't need to get into it. But there's a lot of things where controlled opposition. So, for example, foundations to preserve the world's oceans, preserve this or that. If they want, find themselves in conflict with big plastics companies or something, what the plastics companies do is they, they basically invest in the foundation until they have the controlling interest. And then they control the board. And then you'll find out that, gee, what do you know? Plastics and the problem that they're creating in the ocean just don't show up in their annual reports about what's wrong with the ocean. That's a fact. Right now, that controlled opposition. I have a whole section on the counter over here. Is one of those sections from about there to there is all propaganda and uh, population control and the history of rewriting history. This will only be audio for most people. So, <laughs> oh, sorry. Lauren just showed me a section of his library, and it's a, so that's the propaganda. A large pro- section of the library, <laughs> by the way. Yeah. And there's some like really shocking data there, right? So my point comes back to it's a complicated world. We're embedded with misinformation from the top down. A lot of what's being promoted as science is pseudoscience. It's actually agenda. It's serving private interests. It's not real science. We know this now because we saw the, the uh, in the 20th century, we very saw, clearly saw the chemical companies try to do this back around the, uh, the uh, Love Canal, 
if you remember in the 70s, a lot of people being poisoned, the chemical companies denying it, the baby birth defects. And finally, you know, citizens had to come up and call it out. Love Canal was the beginning of sort of the uh, unraveling of the toxicity of the chemical companies. Then later we saw it with cigarette companies giving us science that says cigarettes aren't bad for you. We know that's all horseshit today. Now we've seen it with the oil companies and we know – you know, depending on what side of the political field you fall into, which I think is all bullshit, right versus left is all distraction for the chumps anyway. And what we see is that, again, we saw the oil companies lying, uh, faking science, pushing false science, paying universities and well-known scientists to promote pseudoscience, claiming that there's no carbon impact, this, that, or the other thing. And we're going to find out pharmaceuticals, same thing, all the big industries, same bullshit. What people believe is science is actually being sold to them as science is actually pseudoscience uh, serving special interests. So we live in a landscape of lies and bullshit. So where do we find some, some grounding for ourselves you know, to get through the day, to get through life, to have ambition, to have hope? And so for me, all that stuff, all that research just drives the content of the stories I want to create so that hopefully they have life the way that Dr. Seuss's content had life. You know, uh, my mother read it to me. If I had kids, I'd read it to my kids. I know people that have kids. They're reading the same stories again and again because they hold a certain legacy. You know, Orwell will be read until they uh, exclude it from the school system. I, I think the fact that um, you, you've had these successful remakes recently is, uh, is a testament to that you're achieving what you're trying to do as far as that goes. You know, thanks. I think, uh, we, and we have to be clear, right? Like all of that is fine and good as long as it's good entertainment, <laughs> right? Like we got to get real. Right. No, you know, documentaries sell less for a reason. People aren't interested. They want to escape. I want to create things that matter to me and that, and that share my point of view and that I feel good about. But I also think there's value in just, in, in pure pop, yeah, because I love the way it brings people together, people of different backgrounds yeah. that they can enjoy the same thing and share it in a conversation. Even it can be something that brings, you know, brings those people together. I think that's I think that's a great value. And I, people I who have horrible lives, personal lives, really dysfunctional families, something that can take them away, even if it doesn't offer much more. It's a great service. Yeah, we could almost think of entertainment as the campfire. Right. And originally the campfire brought the community together at night or whenever it was cold, right? And all you need to do is be cold and have a fire and you can see how well you can get along with people. <laughs> you know what I mean? It brings you together and you sit there mesmerized by the fire and that's a, it's a catalyst to bring people together. So that's a great thing. And I'm not saying that all people that create content should think about it this way. I, I'm really not having any judgment on other things except the poor practices, right? That I'm judging. But if someone wants to make superficial games, if someone wants to do that, that's, I, I don't care as long as it's not doing bad. You right, know? Right. And uh, I personally, I'm not going to make games that heroicize war, right? It's not going to happen. So, oh, would you do the next Call of Duty? If I do, we'll be taking down the White House, <laughs> right? We're not going to be going after, you know, hunting brown people around on the planet and claiming that they're terrorists or something. Like enough of this shit already, right? Like that. Yeah. I find it just to be a uh, – and I'm not delivering – I understand that. I really do. Yeah, you know, like – I think it is a bit offensive that wars that are contemporary, that are extremely muddied with where's the real truth, are being turned into entertainment as parents are suffering the loss of kids, as people are suffering the loss of loved ones in it. It's instantly being turned into consumer entertainment, which I think is, is a, uh, it's just something I wouldn't want to participate in. It's inevitable that it happens. It's unfortunate that um, a lot of times it doesn't really respect the realities of, I mean, we, 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 we see the same thing in, in other kinds of media and film and so on, but we also, we, we all know the examples of the movies that, that do it better and do it right. Right. And, um, and they're harder. Yeah, they, they are harder. <laughs> right? They're harder because it's not just about, okay, did they laugh at this line? It's like, are we staying true to what the idea is here? Uh, you know, the general philosophy that's shaping this story in the first place or, you know, the nugget of, of uh, insight that it's trying to deliver. But anyway, so none of this is really that compatible with business, <laughs> right? There's a tension there for sure. There's certainly a tension. So 
my partner tells me this all the time. She goes, Lauren, if you just wanted to make money, you could have done that in so many easier, different ways. You know, you didn't have to try and burn both bridges uh, or build both bridges at the same time, I should say. Okay, so I'm going to kind of slice the interview right there, call that sesh one. And in session two with Lauren, we get into how do you have success today with your own IP starting from scratch? What does that look like? What does it take to succeed on Kickstarter is a big area we get into. And in the meantime, obviously, Lorne brought up lots of different people, lots of different resources, games, designers, artists, films that were important to him. And those are all going to be on the blog at playmakerspodcast.com. You can contact me there or I will see you in part two of this interview with the absolutely inimitable Lorne Lanning.